kickboxing. Beats and rhymes. No one can do it better. Dave Berlin, an attorney on behalf of Salita Promotions, has filed an appeal against the decision that was won by William Skull over Vladimir Shiskin weekend gone in Germany, where Skull is based for the 168-pound IBF title. The Cuban came away with what was, in my opinion, a controversial decision. The design commentators didn't say anything about the result, so I can only conclude that they thought it was fair dinkum. But in my post-fight review, I thought it was closer, perhaps even Stevens, and I didn't keep an official scorecard. All right, there was complaints about the officiating of the bout as well as the scoring, apparently. The referee didn't penalise or warn William Skull for hitting behind the head, hitting after the bell, holding, Salita said. I can't really say I noticed Skull fouling blatantly like that. Apparently, the CompuBox numbers had Shiskin landing 110 to Skull's 80 over the course of the fight and outlanding or matching his opponent in 8 of the 12 rounds. Now, this one here is baffling. Is how Judge Rene Fabig could find the 12th round for Skull. It says here on the CompuBox, the 12th was 13-5 in Shiskin's favour. But listen, forget the CompuBox. Go watch it yourself. How anyone scored the 12th round for William Skull is unbelievable. Leaveable. But it says here Fabig and the referee are German. Well, that's suspect already. Team Shiskin are upset because they had plans to fight Canelo, which, um, no disrespect. Skull might have Canelo's old belt, but is he really in contention for a Canelo fight right now? But they're saying there's no Canelo fight for Shiskin if there's no title. They're hoping that the German commission overturned the result, conducting a review with a neutral panel of judges. I don't think this will come to much. I mean, if there is a case for corruption, the IBF ain't going to own up and the German commission ain't going to own up. Did anyone see the fight? What do you think? Boxing. Beats and rhymes. No one can do it better. Regis Progress says that Jack Catterall is a decent fighter. He sighs as he says that. For me, he's a decent fighter. Like I keep saying, he's just not on my level. But he's decent. The only thing he's got for me is the Josh Taylor thing. What else? He's got two close fights with Josh Taylor. He won the first one, I definitely feel, like they gave it to Josh Taylor. The second one was closer, but they felt they owed him, and they gave it to him. But you look at it besides that, what does Jack Catterall have on his resume? I can see nothing. I really can't see nothing. Pro Grace, 29-2 and two with 24 stoppages. Two-time light welterweight champion. He's 35 years of age. Hasn't fought since last December where he was schooled, washed on the scorecards. He didn't win a round and was floored by Devin Haney en route to a 12-round decision loss where he lost his WBC 140-pound title in the process. Is he on the slide? He didn't look clever against Danita Zerilla six months previous before losing to Devin Haney in the same year. Catterall, no spring chicken, he's 31, has stupidly, in my opinion, used up two years of his career chasing that Josh Taylor fight. And while he did avenge the controversial 2022 loss, he should have been going for world titles and let Josh come to him. Pro Grace, I feel he should have had a tune-up before taking his fight because boxing construct and southpaw stance, good boxer, good counter-puncher, accurate. Isn't something you want to go in there and not be at your sharpest, Catterall. He's 29-1-0 with 13 inside the distance. It's a battle of South Wars. A lot of people have Catterall washing Regis' progress on the scorecards. Catterall has a habit of taking his foot off the gas though. So I think he's going to be a close fight because of that. You can't afford to take your foot off the gas against former champions. The last time progress was over here, it was controversial. And he fought a better version of Josh Taylor than Jack Carroll did. That could have went either way. I think he's going to be a controversial one. And I think the American media might be saying after that Progress made the mistake of taking the plane to get robbed in the scorecards in the UK. I'm looking forward to it though. I'm picking Carroll by the slightest of margins. And it could be controversial as well. Looking forward to Reese Bellotti versus Michael Gomez Jr. for the British and Commonwealth Super Featherweight titles. That's going to be a really good one. Also looking forward to James Flint against Campbell Hatton, the rematch. Flint beat Campbell last time out for that central area title at lightweight. If Campbell loses again, does the nepotism end? Are his days on match from numbered? 
all to play for for Campbell. Welterweight prospect Pat McCormack 5-0. He gets a run out. And so does Janaid Boston, another match from Prospect, super welterweight. Boxing. Beats and rhymes. No one can do it better. Harlem Eubank was supposed to fight this Friday in Bolton. The fight has been moved to November the 22nd in Newcastle. He takes on a Frenchman, Nure Erdogan, at the Walker Dome in Newcastle. Harlem is now 19-0, 8 inside the limit. Wasserman promoted, 30 years of age. His 27-year-old opponent has scored just one stoppage on his way to winning 16 fights and losing three. The plan is to bring Eubank back to his hometown in early 2025, should he be victorious. More than 2 million tuned in to see Harlem Eubank's last fight in Brighton, televised on Channel 5, when he stopped Timo Schwarzkopf in 11. That's over a year ago. What a lot of people are not talking about is when Ben Shalom does a lot of his pranks, there's casualties. He didn't think about Fabio Wardley's reputation being potentially stained as a cheat. All the work that Queensbury have put in, well, not Queensbury, Matram really, but that Queensbury have to put in to promote the guy. Then there's the glove manufacturer who are being scrutinized now. Now, from what I'm hearing, the gloves are not customized. If he's talking about customized, all it is is the color. They do not alter the regulated gloves, just the color. But he had no issues with fly gloves before Fraser Clark got beaten. And then his fighter was using fly gloves on Saturday. Adam Azim. So when people are saying, oh, he's just standing up for himself. It's okay standing up for yourself. But not at the expense of others. Like that stunt he pulled on the undercard of the first Fabio Wardy fraser Clark fight. Dragging Harlem all the way from Brighton to the O2. Eubank Sr., Barry McGuigan all up in the ring. What about Harlem Eubank? He thought he had a career-defining fight, only to find Ben Shalom blamed him for the fight not happening. Although it was Team Azim and Team Shalom who called out Eubank, who travelled all the way from Brighton. Why would he travel all the way from Brighton to the O2 to not want the fight? So, no consideration for Harlem Eubank using him like that. Yeah, 2 million people tuned in on Channel 5 to watch Eubank against Timo Schwarzkopf. And while that is impressive, the question then is how is his profile not increased? Channel 5 Boxing gets more views than The Zone. Not talking about pay-per-view events, we're just talking about viewership numbers. Queensbury, The Zone, and Sky. So why are the fighters not bigger draws? It's alright getting a lot of numbers watching your event, but how much budget are you spending on the cards? I've never heard of Harlem's opponent, Nurali Erdogan. Never heard of him. Now, Adam Azim had a lot less people viewing his contest on Saturday. Why are the media talking more about that card than this one? Well, Channel 5, the production, it's not that good. It's not promoted very well. If the fight was this Saturday, I wouldn't have known nothing about it until today. Whoever watched Adam Azim, let's say it got 500,000 or a million people viewing it. Most of that 500,000 or million tuned in to see that fight and that card specifically. Channel 5, it's free-to-air terrestrial television. A lot of people are flicking through the channels and they see boxing comes up and they watch it. How much of that 2 million are connected to the social media boxing circle? What's the audience retention like? If the slot is for an hour, how much of them watch the whole hour? How much people on Twitter or Facebook do you hear talking about the Channel 5 cards? Like, there's lots of boxers on social media who've got huge Twitter followings, Instagram followings, but they're not pay-per-view stars, nowhere near. They're social media stars. While on Channel 5, the likes of Harlem Eubank doesn't have no big social media profile. But look how much people are actually viewing his fights. So it's just striking the balance. Getting the people to view your fights and getting a good social media profile. And Channel 5 haven't quite got there. I mean, their YouTube page is absolutely shockingly promoted. I mean, Kelly and Nice, you you need to step your game up. But then again, they're splitting their time between Channel 5 and the Misfits on the Zone. So, can they really promote the Channel 5 boxing brand effectively whilst doing that? We know the Channel 5 platform has potential. After they debuted in 2011 with the British and Commonwealth heavyweight titles being defended by Derek Chisora against Tyson Fury. Chisora lost in what was a very entertaining fight. They were just prospects at that time. Then after that, Channel 5 fell off. They never followed it up. But the potential is there. Mick Hennessy's had a crack at it. Derrick Chisora versus Tyson Fury. That was Mick Hennessy. And now the Salons are having a crack at it. 
and then you have to look at it like this. Two million sounds good, but in 2024 with Freeview a satellite, there's lots of other programming doing a whole lot more numbers than that at that slot there, 10 p.m. Derek Chisora in 2011, Tyson Fury in 2011 were not the personalities they are today. But nevertheless, they were engaging. They had profile on social media. Until Channel 5 can develop their product on social media, it's almost like they're broadcasting like it was the 90s with Nigel Benn, Eubank, Bruno and McGuigan, but just not getting the same amount of success. I don't think Channel 5 are that ambitious. They don't put in a whole load of cards for the year. They don't break the budget on production or the matchups. I guess they're theorising if they walk away from it, they wouldn't have lost much. But if it blows up, then it's win-win all round. Let's keep it real. The Sowlands should have signed Liam Cameron after he lost the split decision to Lyndon Arthur. They should have signed him. But Franks picked him up after the technical decision draw with Ben Whitaker and all the headlines that's made. They should have seen from there that, yo, this guy can fight. That's their job. Not to let the talent escape elsewhere so someone else can benefit from promoting them. The Salons are probably more interested in this rematch between KSI and Tommy Fury, which is big money. But look, if that's what they're going to do, they need to concentrate on that. And let a promoter who's just going to concentrate on the Channel 5 boxing and the Channel 5 roster solely. Boxing. Beats and rhymes. No one can do it better. Looking at this here. T.O. eked out a points win against Sandal Martin, December 2022. The contract indicated that a potential extension deal would only be effective if Lopez defeated Jose Pedraza. But due to an injury, Pedraza was replaced by Sandor Martin. Now, I don't want to go too deep into it because for all I know, maybe T.O. is in the right, but he's not the brightest spark. He's got to keep it real. But Top Rank's job is to get T.O. fights. And if an opponent has to be replaced, a late replacement has to be brought in. There's not really much Top Rank can do about that, except get T.O. a new opponent, which they did. If this goes to court, if it was to go to court, Will it really be an effective defense to say, well, the contract states the extension is only valid if he beats Jose Pedraza? I don't think that would be valid. Top Rank did their job and got you your replacement opponent. Pedraza was only put in the contract because that's the choice of opponent that T.O. accepted and Top Rank accepted. So they put that in the contract. But it could have been any name. It could have been my name. If that was such a concern to T.O., he should have got himself an attorney to ask Bob, well, what happens now? Because you've got Pedraza. His name is in the contract, not Sandor Martin. Now, they could either agree to make an amendment or perhaps top rank allow T.O. to become a free agent if he chooses to. But that never happened. He fought Josh Taylor, Steve Claggett, Jermaine Ortiz after. Why is it coming up now that the contract's invalid? You know, there's other stipulations that if Lopez won another title, his contract would be automatically extended. And he did that when he beat Josh Taylor, 2023. You know, he announced his retirement after the Josh Taylor fight, which we knew weren't going to last. It says here on Boxing Social that T.O. thought that announcing his retirement would nullify any contractual extension. However, his retirement has not been officially recognized by top rank, which continues to add time to the contract due to the fighter's inactivity. Bob Aram said, T.O. Fimo acts like he has a screw loose. I like the kid, but I can't figure him out. And he makes no logical sense. Aram claimed that the boxer signed a contract extension before and after the Martin fight. According to Aram, Lopez might be showing his legal team the wrong contract, <laughs> causing unnecessary confusion. Dealing with Tia Fimo is like dealing with Alice in Wonderland, Bob Aram added, referring to the unpredictable behavior of the boxer in recent months. Despite the tensions, both parties are working to resolve the legal conflict, although no agreement or dates have been confirmed for Lopez's return to the ring. Hey, look, man, let's keep it real. He's looked like ass in his last few fights against Claggett and Jermaine Ortiz. He's looked like absolute ass. You know what I mean? Talking about he's going to fight Terence Crawford. For what? He signed a couple of extensions with top rank. Why keep signing the extensions if that's the case? He was complaining the other day that he's never broke a million for a fight. He's got 700, 400, 800K. I'm sure he's had a million dollar purses, but he's never cleared a million after expenses is what I think he means. And taxes, I guess. 
Well, perhaps he needs to grow up. Stop calling people monkeys. Handle his business accordingly. Grow up. T.O. thinks he's this big draw, but he couldn't sell out the hula at the MSG, which is the smaller theater at the MSG. That was for the Josh Taylor fight. He's not the big attraction he thinks he is. After he beat Lomachenko, he got gassed up. Bob was not gonna break his purse structure with Tiafimo for that Cambosis fight. And this guy got in a big hissy fit, threw his toys out the pram. Bob said, okay, let it go to a purse bid. Triller won it, but there was a lot of stuff going on. Pandemic, Triller screwed up a lot of stuff. And it ended up with the second bid, which was with Matram. Then he ended up blaming Eddie and the zone for him losing the fight for reasons I'm not sure. Perhaps the the zone logo on the canvas threw him off. He blamed them. The Triller purse bid was six million. So he thought, yeah, I've cracked it. But the next nearest bid was Matram Dazone, 2.3. So he was frustrated and he took it out on them. And now the likes of Terence Crawford is making major purses. That seems to really be bothering him. The likes of Devin has made more money. And now, oh, you can keep the black fighters. I bought the Bud Light advertising to top rank. They're monkeys. He's taking it out on black fighters now. He's a big crybaby. Nothing more than that. Boxing. Beats and rhymes. No one can do it better.